Hello and welcome to the Odds Checker betting show. This is your Christmas racing preview. It was a Boxing Day preview, but we're going to be looking ahead at a couple more of the Christmas crackers in the racing calendar at the end of 2020. I'm your host, George Ellick, and I'm joined by two expert panel guests to give you their thoughts on the festive racing. First, by no means foremost, we've got Ed Quigley, racing broadcaster and journalist, didn't mean to do you a disservice there, and it's just something that... <laughs> I've been called worse, don't worry about it. <laughs> Very nice Christmas jumper. Yours is much more festive than my one. We can't quite see the lights, which is a shame, but uh, for those listening rather than watching, it's a very fetching, flashy red and white number. Um, how are you doing, Ed? Good to see yeah, you. Yeah, not, not too bad at all, Dad. Uh, yeah, excellent. Obviously, um, bigger things in the world worrying people at the moment, but nonetheless, the, the racing is, a, as you say, a great release. Uh, so much good um, action to look forward to over the next week or so. Uh, it's almost so much it's hard to know where to turn isn't it but it's a brilliant stuff and uh looking forward to covering it over the the next hour or so yeah absolutely and, and andrew thornton joins us as well former jockey of course and, and a good friend of ours at odds checker andrew it must have been an interesting time being a, a jockey over christmas with the amount of boxing day racing there was i can't imagine you were tucking into too many pigs in blankets and glasses of red wine back in the day no back in the early days it was <laughs> there, i remember there was air air used to be on on boxing day and she, obviously, there was about nine meetings, but obviously we're, we're curtailed this year down to three. Mm. Um, and uh, it's, I feel I feel sorry for the for what I call the journeyman jockeys who aren't going to get a chance on Boxing Day because that was always the day where everybody sort of got a ride. Mm. You know, you seven pound, ten pound claimers. Um, you got to you got to spin around whether it be Sedgefield Market Race and Fontwell. Whereas this year, you know, those those guys are really going to suffer over the Christmas period. Yeah, normally my job for a Boxing Day preview would be very difficult finding the best races of the day. And we do have racing still at Weatherby and Wincanton and Wolverhampton as well as Kempton and over in Ireland, Leopardstown and Limerick. But a much, yeah, much diluted calendar uh, given the year that we've had. Fingers crossed next year, there'll be plenty of meetings all over the country again. Um, and for this, we're just going to run through the three grade ones at Kempton. We're then going to go over the Irish Sea and speak about a couple of races that have sadly cut up a bit with some of the more exciting names coming out. Uh, and then we'll be looking ahead and covering the Welsh Grand National on the 27th and then the Savills Chase the day after that as well. So plenty there. I should mention as well, before I spoke about Ed's Christmas jumper, so it's only fair that I give the, the listeners rather than the viewers the opportunity to know that Andrew Thornton is currently wearing red reindeer uh, horns on his head as well. And they are also flashing. So... Antlers, antlers. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, that is embarrassing. Uh, I would ask the editor and producer to edit that out, but I know he won't. So we'll, we'll move on pretty quickly and swiftly to the first race we're going to be covering, and that is the 150 at Kempton. It is the Labrooks Quarto Star Novice Chase, the Grade One. Before we get into it, I'll be looking at the Odds Checker app throughout this for the very best odds, the best place terms, bookie offers, free bets. And the very best tipsters, sadly, Andy Holding can't be with us today, nor can Daryl Carter, but they are two of the very many tipsters across sport who you should download the app so you can read their musings, the first place and the best place to get those, especially with Andy's, whose prices seem to vanish as soon as they go up on the app. So if you want to get Andy's bets on the prices that he puts them up at, that is the way to do it. But onwards now to the 150 at Kempton on Boxing Day over three miles. And Shan Blue is the two to one favourite. That is a standout price with Bet Victor. Uh, the big breakaway is 11 to four. If the cap fits, nine to two. And Rillo, seven to one. Kaluki, 12 to one. One for the team, 14 to one. And Golden Fortune, 33 to one. Ed, you can kick us off on Boxing Day. Who do you fancy here? Good question. Um... I usually know, George, I'm the forgiving type, so I'm I'm going to I'm going to side with the big breakaway. But look, Shamblu is incredibly exciting. hasn't touched a twig, um, but hasn't been a great deal. I know it beat Snow Leopardesque uh, easily last time out, but uh, th I mean this is a step up in terms of class from their hurling days. The big breakaway, you'd say, hold Shamblu. I mean the big breakaway was comfortably ahead of Shamblu when they raced in the Ballymore at the Chowder Festival. Uh, the big breakaway, uh, a little bit of enigma, which has been the case, as we well documented, with the Colin Tizard team uh, over the last few months or so. Well, they've had four winners in out of the last 50 runners or something, and I think three of those have been at odds on that have gone in. And obviously the big breakaway was turned over at 2-9 to nine last time at Exeter, but 
I mean, that race was a little bit of a farce. It went a cruel. He had, had no one to make the lead. He dropped down from three miles and extended two miles three. Uh, it, uh, just everything about that race just looked wrong for him. Uh, I'm prepared to forgive him stepping back up to three miles, given the way that when he went round Cheltenham over three, he looked to really enjoy himself and he looked better the further he went in my in my view. And I, I gather it was Robbie Powers' idea to come back to two and a half to just sharpen his jumping up and make him concentrate a bit more. And that plan kind of backfired as he got mugged in the closing stage. And I thought it just looked like a galloping three mile chaser who was one pace over two miles three extra. So. It's, it's a tricky one. Chamblou has been absolutely electric over his fences. Um, admittedly, I think he's kind of had his own way to some extent. Uh, this is a pretty good race. We shouldn't discount if the cap fits. Obviously, he's a, he's a class actor. Just wonder whether the kind of tight twists and turns of Kempton necessarily suit that horse. Uh, Foss Lass on a big galloping track, he seemed to really enjoy himself. Thought it had to be said. Um, and Rio and Kaluki and then Bar, I'm not quite sure up to it. I, I make it between the top two. I think it's Shambaloo versus the Big Breakaway. Big Breakaway just looked so exciting at one stage last year and looked even more exciting after his chase debut over three miles at Cheltenham. I'm prepared to forgive last time out, given the stable under a cloud, and I just think it was totally the wrong trip for him. Back up at three. Uh, I think this is a, there's no excuses here. This is time to see the, the proper Big Breakaway of offences. And I, I think he, again, I, I come through prices, and he's, he's twice the price of Shambaloo, and that, that would be the, the kind of angle I'd go, or near, near enough twice the price of Shambaloo. I'd, I'd side towards the big breakaway. Big breakaway at 11 to 4. Andrew, what are your thoughts on horses that get turned over at heavy odds on? Um, well, look, at the time was 15 seconds slower than the next race. The handicap down at uh, Exeter, it was mm. just... He, he's not a front runner, is he? The big breakaway. Didn't have a choice, though. Um and Puppy Power, he's not the type of jockey to go out right hard from the front and enforce it early doors. That's just not how he rides. Uh, I'd, I'd slightly worry about the, the tight attack for him rather than if the cat fits. Because if the cat fits, he's run round, one round Aintree, sharp track. Um, and I, I like the way Harry, um, Harry Fry's horses are running at the moment. They're in a real good nick. Mm. Real good nick. Um, but I'm a big fan of Enrillo. Um, he's, a, he's a real strong traveller. I think that this racer will be run to suit him because one thing he does is travel. And you may argue, I, he was pulling up when he hit the front at Exeter last time out. He's so slick and quick over his fences. With with Gaul and Fortune being in here, likely to rock and roll from the front, it'll suit the big breakaway. It'll, it'll suit the whole field, to be perfectly frank, because Gaul and Fortune will go from the front. And he, he he's sort of the... The, the less sexy horse, you'd say, from the, I suppose, the training point of view, smaller yards. Mm -hmm. But he'd be dangerous from the front if he's allowed to roll away round those bends, that last bend where you swing into the home straight. There isn't so much of a jumping test in the home straight, is there? Because there, there'll be no third last. There'll only be the two in the home straight this time around. So the ground looks like at uh, Kempton, it's going to be better than it has been for a few years, which I think is great from that point of view. So I'm an Enrillo fan. Just I, I got Peter Chepstow first time out when he looked all over the winner. But I just think the nature of the race and how it's going to be run is right up his street. Big Shan Blue fan. Obviously, he's, um, he's jumping slick and quick. But it's like, uh, like a lot of these. This is the first time they're really taking each other on. So you're not too sure where you're at. But I'm just surprised that Enrillo, with a, with a, you might say the Paul Nichols factor, is such a big price. Mm. Yeah, and Rillo, best price at the moment is seven to one. That's with Bet Victor. So seven to one and Rillo for Andrew. The big breakaway is eleven to four. Shamblu getting a lot of respects, but uh, at two to one. I think we agree the rightful favourite, maybe, but not one to necessarily side with in what looks a decent field. Just seven run, I should say. Although Paddy Power, as they often do, have stuck their neck out and say they will still offer three places a fifth of the odds. And they are six to one about Enrillo if that's the way that you wanted to play it. Uh, we'll move on now to the 225, the Labbrook's Christmas hurdle, the next grade one on the card of three. And Epitont is unsurprisingly at the top of the market at two to five with Silver Streak nine to two, Bally Andy 11 to one, Floresta 16 to one, Diego de Charmille 33 to one. Epiton at two to five. We're not going to sit here, Andrew, are we, and, and sit here and say, you know, get get the mortgage on. It's an absolute sure thing, but it's pretty hard to find any fault in her. I think somebody's got to price up, will she be in front before the last or not? <laughs> not, no, absolutely no chance. <laughs> um, 
you know, the way Aiden's rode her last time out to, to ride him with that much confidence, a length, what, three quarters of a length down at the last at Newcastle, going to win by mm-hmm. five. She's an express train. You know, it ticks all the boxes, doesn't she, with the, the Met, you know, people will argue about the mayor's allowance. I'm, I'm in favour of it because could you, Dawn Run probably wouldn't have won a Gold Cup or run in a Gold Cup without a mayor's allowance. It's there to to entice them to run in the better races. And physically, the mares aren't as big, are they? They're just not as big and physically physically strong. But nimble, neat, quick, accurate, ticks every single box on that front. You can't look past it. If there's a good two to five chance, or if there's a better two to five chance, find it for me. <laughs> Ed, would you agree with that? Uh, pretty much, yeah. I, I mean... <clears throat> It's interesting they put Floressa in here and of course the cynical side of me says she's going to be employed as the pacemaker because the only way I could see Epitome losing this is if the race turned into a bit of a farce and became a bit of a muddling sprint up the home straight because Silver Street wants to be held up in last. Uh, Diego and Charmille want to be held up in last. Baliandi is the only is clearly going to try and, you know, without Floressa to fill, Baliandi had been the one going forward to try and make all and if Baliandi had departed early... Uh, I think a lot of the jockeys would have just been looking at each other, <laughs> waiting to see who's going to be trying to deliver over the last hurdle. So I think Floressa yeah, and Valley Andy will be in the slowly Sorry, run Andy. race. A slowly run race, Ed. Though, would would you would you? I would say Epiton would be a Group Two horse on the flat, maybe better, because because she's got so much speed. I, I don't yeah. I don't think I, I wouldn't worry I wouldn't worry if the trotted round for a mile and a half. Yeah, yeah, but I, I see your point of view. I, I just think, given the way she quickened up off a, a strong pace in the champion hurdle, Henderson's probably looked at it and thought, we don't want any any silly shenanigans here. Um, because if they go a fair old clip, I think she'll cruise through, pick all these up and, and go clear. And it's a bit of a non-event, to be honest with you, in, in that sense. Uh, she's very slick over her hurdles. And um, yeah, I, I take what Andy's saying. Yeah, she's pretty quick. Look, all, all in all, it, it's hard to see a scenario where she finds a way to lose unless she makes a... Something silly happens, like something falls in front of her or she makes an unexpected error. But um, as far as Christmas hurdles go, this reminds me of the time I did a preview for this and for Heen, really. I, I think just turns up wins and we move on to the next. There is an early without Epiton market. Silver Streak, the four to five favourite. Uh, Baliandi, five to two. Floresa, four to one. Diego de Charmille, ten to one. That's with Genting Bet. Anything catch your, your ear or your eye there? I, I think Silver Streak's, the, Silver Streak's the one for the, to, to, to go and finish second. I, he, he was unlucky, wasn't he, in the international? I mean, if they, for me, I don't understand why the last... I'd, I'd love to have seen the last turtle just taken out um, mm. and, and left it out for the last race as well. And Because in races like that, you don't want any ifs, buts or maybes. And I think Evan Williams, I take my hat off to him because... He, he doesn't moan or groan about a bit of bad luck here. He just gets on with it. He, he, he plays with the cards he's dealt. Mm. I'm very frustrated. Very frustrated. Um, but he loves fast ground, doesn't he? He loves, he, loves, he loves a flat track and he loves the right ground, just from his point of view, to share methods and the rest. So not much of a betting heat there. I try my best, guys, but both of them, <laughs> a couple of odd shots there, maybe. Epiton, not a bad two to five shot, and Silver Streak, the one to follow her home. On to what looks a far better betting heat, I would say, at least, and a really, really interesting King George at three o'clock on Kempton. The big race of the day, and Clan Desobo is just favourite at 15 to 8, ahead of surname at 2 to 1. Santini, 13 to 2. Lost in translation, 8 to 1. Real Steel, 16 to 1. Waiting patiently alongside St. Calvados at 25 to 1. St. Calvados, a bit of blue around, a short 16s in places, but obviously proving popular with some people. Frode on 33 to 1. Black Op, 100 to 1. Ed, 9 run at the moment. Solve it for us. <laughs> yeah. Um, tentatively with Clander Zobo. I mean, Paul Nichols says he... He's finding it hard to split his, his big two. And obviously, surname's the highest rated horse in training. And Clander Zobo's won this race twice. I, mean, I just think playing the percentages, this is Clander Zobo's backyard, isn't it? He absolutely loves it around here. Uh, ground should be absolutely spot on for him. Um, he jumps, he travels. 
he ran really well last time at Haydock. Uh, I mean, got unlucky in the fact they had an absolute deluge, didn't they? Like an eight-hour constant barrage of rain, which turned it really testing. And uh, he jumped and travelled as well as anything, uh, coming to two out. And then the old petrol gauge just came on. This is his, his race. I mean, surname, the question marks were there, and there are to some extent about his ability at three miles. Yet last time out in up at Weatherby... Um, I mean, he swatted the Messiah V's, didn't he? It wasn't even really a race. He mm. didn't have to come out of second gear. Uh, I, I just think, that obviously, this is a step up. And I think, unusually, as you know, George, I'm looking for re- really exciting left to fill things to come into the equation. But uh, I do think, I mean, well, you're getting a, roughly about four to nine that Paul Nichols wins the King George. And it's almost, he's got one hand on the trophy already. I'd, I'd be tentatively with Klanders Obo. I, I just think he's... He's the, the solid choice. He's won two King, George, King Georges already, and there's looking at the weather forecast. Hard to believe here in Cheltenham, given we've had about a month's rainfall in, in the last six hours, yet Kempton <laughs> doesn't look too bad. He's probably going to be riding around good to soft, and that should be you know right in his favour. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned St. Calvados because he was the one I was just going to throw in. I mean, he was 33-1 to 1, um, about 24 hours ago. The value has kind of gone on him, but... If he could run to the min form of the Ryanair when beaten the neck, I mean, officially rated 167. He, he's, he's right at the back size of a few of these on official figures anyway. Um, and he's shaped as though he wants three miles, in my opinion. The way he came up the hill in the Ryanair, he looked like a horse who he wants to crack it three miles plus. I wouldn't be shocked if in time he ends up uh, in the Chantler Gold Cup at the end of this season, to be honest with you. But it's a big ask first time out. Uh, on the comeback after a little setback. But nonetheless, I could see him having a patient ride and, and running well to mop up the pieces into third, especially with uh, Surname in here and Frodon in here. I'd imagine they're going to go a fair old gallop at, uh, at the head of affairs, if you like. So, uh, Klanders Obo for me, um, with St. Calvados potentially placed, but uh, uh, no massively strong views in this one, um, in, in this one, George. I mean, looking at last year's, Race. I mean, Clanders over beat Surname by 21 lengths. And it, and it wasn't like Clan's form coming into this, suggesting it went off 11 to 2. Surname, of course, was the was the more fancied one. Andrew, when, when you look at that and you look at last year's race and how it played out and the fact that Clanders Obo has proven twice in this race, you know, as Ed said, this is this is his backyard. Are you surprised to see how close they are in the betting? No, I'm not. Because... <laughs> I mean, no, Harry Cobden knew he was beaten going to the first last year. The yeah. surname was flat as a pancake, you know. That the Altion surname served it up to each other at Ascot. Um, and for Paul Nichols, no, I think both Nicky Henderson and Paul Nichols bought into the fact that this is the race of the season. But it just wasn't the ideal situation for both horses first time out. Um, but surname, well, this year, went up to Weatherby, went... Everybody thought going left-handed that this isn't going to suit him. And he literally went round in a hat canter. And you might think, oh, God, it wasn't much of a race. Well, I right ran a hell of a race, didn't he? Mm. It's, uh, behind Cloth Cap, who only had 10 stone uh, down at Newbury. And the form's solid, absolutely rock solid. He's a class horse. I, bear in mind, I'd say surnames had the ideal prep. Klander Zorbo has been to... Haydock before and finished fourth and never really got into it a couple of years ago. An ideal preparation for Kempton. This year, he had a proper race up at Haydock. Um, there was no hiding place behind Bristol Demai. He was bang in the mix. He came there. A few argued that Sammy Twiston maybe should have just bided his time a little bit more and had a go at Bristol Demai. But he, you know, he got comprehensively beaten. He'd been away from a race course gallop. That's what Paul Nichols had tried to get him ready for Haydock this time. Um, I'm, I just like Cernan. I'm, I'm going to stick go with him. I just think he's had a, a great prep. And, you know, I, I don't think Harry Cobden's had a choice, mm. um, personally. And, you know, Cernan officially rated five pounds higher. Don't know whether I agree with that. And, but uh, I'm going to give him another chance because I know that he just wasn't right last year. And he was, I thought he did very well to run. I'll be as close to him as he did for as long as he did. But he's at the perfect prep. Um, I'm a big surname fan. Santini, I think the right thing to run him because he's a lazy so and so. Sharpen him up. It'll sharpen him up. He's one of those horses that just reminds me of a, he's a real old, he's not what I call a typical, Nick, Nick, he's not a typical Nicky, Nicky Henderson horse. Mm. He's a quite a heavy top type. He needs his racing. He just needs racing. 
the bet you'll see him at his best at Cheltenham. I don't think he'll. I don't. This this maybe isn't his track, but he's got to run him. Lost in translation. I think there might be more forward on him this time around. Very much so, rather than just dropping him in and and biding biding the time on him. Real steel's very interesting, but it'll be interesting to see how he goes. Waiting patiently, goes well fresh, but it's that is a huge ask. I think Frodon's probably overpriced at uh, at thirty three to one. Thirty three to one. He's he's got to be overpriced because there was not well, they didn't jump any fences up at entry, so it just turned out into absolute no contest for fraud on up at entry. I'd imagine he'll be allowed a soft lead because I, I think Harry Cobden he doesn't have to make it on surname. It was proved that the horse has settled down uh, so much now. So surname for me, I'll go fraud on each way. Might might pinch a purse. Interestingly, I mean, the beauty of Odds Checker here, it works. Whilst you were talking there, Andrew, I was just watching the price on Santini just go. <laughs> Someone somewhere has just, I mean, I've, I've literally watched the kept in from 11 to 2, 6 to 1 to, to basically 9 to 2 with Unibet, Paddy's, Betfair Sportsbook and Skybet. Hills are still the best price at 6 to 1. I mean, Ed, a sharp three miles around Kempton surely isn't Santini's bag, is it? Not for me. I mean, we saw him in the Corto style novices or the Feltham um, a couple of seasons ago. He was, I mean, he was taken off his feet and he, he did stay on strongly, which is the case with him, really. But I mean, the cynical side of it tells me um, this is just personal conjecture, obviously. But Nicky Henson's had the call from JP McManus and says Champ wants to run in the Cotswold chase. So we'll give Santini a run in this and then he'll go straight to the Cheltenham Festival. <laughs> so Santini and Champ don't have to clash against each other on Trials Day. Well, I may be totally wrong, but we'll, when Champ's decked up for the Cotswold chase, we'll, we'll see. But uh, I can't. This is not his race at all, is it? If he'd been going anywhere at Christmas, the Savile's chase would have been perfect for him. Mm. Uh, soft ground, three miles uh, in Ireland would, would have been, but obviously with the travel ban, that wouldn't have been able to happen. But I, I'd be very surprised if... Santini, uh, even allowing for excuses last time out, of fences out and everything, um, he couldn't beat Lakeview Lad if he could turn up around Kempton and beat Klandazovo and Surname et al. I'd be very shocked. The only way Santini could get, for me, could get into it would be if, if the, the deluge were in. That, mm, would, yeah. that, would be the, that would be the time That's when a good point, yeah. Yeah. he could get into it if there was a deluge, but it, it doesn't look like that. But hey, it's a grade one race. You run them. If they're fit and healthy and you've got a good horse, you just get on and run it. Whether it's the right track, you know, it's a bit like going back to the days, well, Cheltenham wasn't Desi's track, was it? It wasn't his track. Kempton was his track. But David Ellsworth kept running him. I think he went there six times before he won mm. uh, at the you know the festival. And, uh, you know, it, it worked. It, it's not to say he can't win. He's only five to one. He's only mm. five to one. I just don't think the condi- he's got what I would say specific course specialist. But run the race at Cheltenham, you'd flip it round. It's Santini at the top of the market, wouldn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. I mean, what I would say is, you know, Santini best price at the moment, six to one with Hills and Betway. Even if Santini wins and goes off a six to one, I'm pretty sure you'll get bigger during the race on the exchange because I can't imagine he's going to be one that trades short because it'll be plugging on somehow. Um, an absolute boat, as you say, it looks likely to be. Uh, raced off his feet early on with a pace in the race. Um, before we move on from Kempton, guys, there's obviously three other races. Only one of them is priced up, which is the um, the handicap chase, the 115, where uh, Alnadam heads the market three to one ahead of Mister One More at eleven to two, Killer Clown seven to one. Any view on this one, or should we go over to over or, or either the other two races, the uh, the opener or, or the final race? I just flagged up Hold the Note. It was interesting at double figure price. Um, one. Yeah, it's all back in trip. They've they've tried them over three miles on two occasions and the old um the old petrolites come on twice. I mean rally ran really well over two and a half at the Chantler Festival and finishing third um behind Imperial Laura that day. That was that's really smart form. And I, I just think it's one of them over the longer trips. Uh, perhaps pedigree should I just don't think he does. So coming back to two and a half. Uh, I think he, he's a bit, he's got to be taken seriously here and looks to be on a fair mark. So he'd be my each way play in the 115. That's hold the note. I like th- I like third time lucky in the first. Um, for pleasure, got loose on the front end at Cheltenham. He was held up. He must have been 40 lengths behind. Mm. Uh, I just think it, the race wasn't run to suit. He, he's a he's a decent horse who he's run well at Cheltenham. He's got good back back form. I just thought he was unlucky last time out that. Um, well, whether you call it unlucky, 
the winner got away. Mm. Third time lucky price has just come out there with bet 365, 13 to 8 favourite third time lucky in the first and 10 to 1 hold the note for Ed in the second there. So hopefully a few there for you at Kempton on Boxing Day. We're going to stick on Boxing Day and just touch on a couple of races over in Ireland. Firstly at Leopardstown, the 215, the racing post novice chase where Felix Deji is the 13 to 8 favourite ahead of Darva Star at 4 to 1. Blackbow nine to two, Franco de Port six to one, uh, embittered fourteen to one, Ben Rubin forty to one. So Felix Deji, the favourite, Andrew, the rightful favourite here, or can we take him on? Yeah, no, definitely not, definitely not. He's we won a point of point. Um, his form is absolutely rock solid, um, and I just think he's, I think he's the real deal. I think he's a very very exciting horse who. He's going to take go through the ranks. Uh, he tipped up at Galway. Uh, that was back over hurdles, but he's he's two from two over fences. And I just like you know when you look back through his form behind Classical Dream and the the um, the Supreme there at Cheltenham, mm -hmm. uh, he's just got rock solid form all the way through. He's very slick and quick over his fences. If he has a tendency, he does tend to jump a little bit left, but round. Round Leopardstown doesn't really matter, you know. It'll it'll just suit him down to the ground, you know. He's got the beating of Darva Star, who I, ju I just wonder whether he's. It, it's going to be hard work. He's not overly big, and and jumping wise, just not quite as slick and quick. Uh, and Felix Deji, as I say, he, he won a point a point back in the early days, and um, yeah, he's exciting. And one thing he'll do, he'll he'll stay with well. Ed. Yeah, I would actually be taking Felix Deji on, uh, personally. I, I just think Bla Blackbow, uh, really exciting. Um, outside of Shishkin, I think it was the most exciting two-mile novice chase performance I've seen, personally, from the way he jumped and travelled last time out and quickened up in the closing stages. Not a lot was kind of made of it at the time, but if you look at the time it was running as well, it was a really fast, fast time, and he's in it second favourite. And uh, again, <clears throat> keep your eyes on the weather, because um, at the moment I think it's around yielding, but... Um, a couple of friends of mine not too far away from the track say he's absolutely hammering it down all sorts at the moment. So, And I do think Felix Deji is naturally the much quicker, slicker horse. And I do think if the ground did become very soft, became more of a, a proper test, I think that would swing it away from Felix Deji. Was, we've seen when he whizzed around um, you know, some, of the, some of these better tracks on good ground. He's, he's a horse with natural toe. Black Bow looks more of the, you know, the solid stain type, although he did show a kind of unexpected turn of foot, I thought, over two miles last time out. I mean, I didn't back him, but I was just really taken back, by the way, after the last, he lengthened and went clear. So, uh, I mean, sitting on the fence to some extent because of the ground, I think that's going to have a, a, quite a big bearing on, like it always does on a lot of races. But um, Black Bow would be my selection with um, the more the rain, the merrier for him. <laughs> So that bow there, the selection for Eds. Um, one more we're going to look at at Limerick, uh, and that is the Faheen Novice Chase. And last year's Supreme Novice favourite, Asterion Folange, is the even money favourite ahead of Pencil Full of Lead at 9 to 2, Carl Reevy 11 to 2, um, Jan, Jan Idol 6 to 1, and Assemble 14 to 1. I mean, this is one of those where. At 10 o'clock this morning, this is very exciting, but a fair few have come up. But with Asterion Follon, who, you know, first time over uh, over fences last time out, one by six lengths at Punchstown, still a very exciting prospect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, of course, he was pretty well fancy, wasn't he, for the Supreme uh, yeah. back in last year. We had this... It just started diving right-handed, didn't he? At every mm. obstacle, which um, obviously caused some absolute carnage coming to to three out, didn't it? In in the Supreme, and yeah, got off the mark in good style uh, last time out. And it's very interesting that Paul Town then goes all the right way to Limerick just to ride this, rather than what could be a good book of rides at Leopardstown. I and mean, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think he is going there just to ride the Styrian for Uh I know Ruby used to do that, didn't he, back in the day with a, with a couple of horses in this race. But yeah, look, he looks really exciting. Uh, I think you've got. To, Two very different types of horse here against Pencil for the Lead, who I think looks the the proper stayer, who will be the what I'd call the RSA chase type by the end of the season. Whereas the steering for Lange is quite exuberant. It's not hard to envisage he could play between the two and the two and a half mile races, yeah. depending on what it is. So again, I'm sounding like boring here, but if this really does become if this is soft to heavy by the day, it swings it massively towards Pencil for the Lead, I think, because a steering for Lange will not want to over race in the early stages on that type of ground against a horse in here, I think is a proper stay. And Pencil for the lead 
albeit okay, it wasn't a the form you could argue latest expedition ran pretty flat and bowl accounts didn't handle the heavy ground, but pencil for the lead looked absolutely awesome in those conditions last time out, and that that was really exciting. So again, I'm I'm taking on a few of the shorties here, and I'm on balance looking at the weather, pencil for the lead, and again I'll. I'll probably put them, do a pencil full of lead, a black bow double if the ground does go soft or worse. Nice. Andrew, would you be taking on Astero and Falange as well, or do you think this is one, an even money shot worth siding with? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with pencil full of lead as well. Mm. Just think that, it, you know, let's exhibition form, let's exhibition behind Monkfish at, uh, in the in the Alba Battle at the Cheltenham. Yeah, they might say he did run flat, but I thought he, he got and into the ground just looks an out and out chaser with Biden his time over hurdles and I just do worry about the way that uh, Asterion Falange yes you're going right handed at Limerick but he does get he, do, he does go quite severely badly right handed in the latter stages mm. um, to worry to worry um, he's got a he's got a huge a huge engine and a huge reputation but uh, I just think that Keith Donahue and pencil full of lead. What will not be giving him an easy on the front end, and he, this is the horse that will be staying very, very well. As you said, the ground at Limerick will be testing, so I'm so sticking with him. A double tip there for pencil full of lead over at Limerick. Uh, a couple more we're going to do. That's the end of Boxing Day, but we're going to just quickly touch on the Welsh National, then on to the Savills Chase. Uh, the horse I back for the Welsh National New Tide is a non-runner. So that's me doing my money, sadly. Um, Secret Reprieve is 7-2. to two. Springfield Fox is 15-2. to two. Truckers Lodge, 11-1. to one. Uh, The Two Amigos, Christmas in April. Christmas in April is a pretty good name for us, given the moment. I'm pretty sure we'll be having our Christmas in April. Uh, Yala Enki, also 12-1. to one, Those ones. Uh, Ramsey's to tie, 14-1 to one with Prime Venture. 16-1 to one bar. There are plenty in there at the moment. And at the moment... Most firms pay uh, paying four places. A couple paying five. I reckon on the day you'll get six, maybe even seven. I think he's too short. He's there on reputation. He's there on the because he's only got a he's only got to carry a penalty. I think mm. he's got a three pound three pound penalty for winning, whereas he's gone up about ten. So effectively, he's very very well in at the weights. Um, secret reprieve, but the form of that. That race, you know, he beat the two. He beat two amigos. Bobo Matt was back in third. Um, he won well. They they missed out the last fence. He looks like he'll stay well. I can't see any reason why he uh, he won't. So he's definitely a horse who, you know, you'd certainly be having. You'd be keeping keep keeping an eye on. But at, at that price, I can certainly let him go. Uh, Springfield Fox. He's had one of those preparations. I'm sure he'd have had a. I'm sure he'd have quite easily won a, a handicap chase somewhere and gone up another seven. They ran him in a hurdle race to put him put him spot on. But again, I can I can look past him as well. I looking further down the list. I thought Prime Venture ran a great race last year. He he has had. He's the other one of the Evan Williams uh, team. Tom O'Brien's on board, who's won a Welsh National before on Dream Alliance, and. Um, He's only got the 10 stone six on his back. If it, it is going to be very, very heavy. He's got a light weight, which would suit. He's run well in the race before. And as I say, I, I think the horse, that will have done him the world of confidence just having the one run at Sedgefield, Ed. So I think he's my each way shout in the race. Um, and of the others, right, Ramis de Teye is in there again. Mm. He's second in the race before. Um, he's still only an eight-year-old, and the softer it is, the better it will suit him as well. So they're probably the two I'd be playing against the field. You'll have Trucker's Lodge in there. Who's, obviously, he's a bit of a mud lover as well. He's gone up in the weights a fair bit for uh, for winning the Midlands National. So that might that might just play against him. It's a prime venture, fourteen to one, pretty much across the board. Uh, Ramsey's to tell you that fourteen to one is with Betfred. So, Ed, there are the thoughts of Andrew. Uh, are they similar to yours? You, I mean, I, I imagine this is a favourite you're looking to take on. Yeah, I will uh, take on the favourite on price grounds alone. As, as nice as he did it last time out, has to be said. The horse that finished third to him last time out, I thought ran a real eye-catching race for uh, Tom Simmons, is having a great start to the season. And that was Bob O'Mac, who I thought travelled very well for a long way and then appeared empty in the closing stages. But that was his first start for eight months on the back of a wind operation and... 
I, I think he will tighten up a lot for that outing. And I, I think, think John Bowen's on him as well. I think yeah. John Bowen rides him. So it's all in all, I think he's um, he looks he looks the proper type for this race. If you like, I mean, he's only had the ten chase starts, but he's got a lot of experience, and he just looks a resolute gallop. Who will jump in, he'll stay, and he's better off at the weights with. Uh, secret reprieve from last time out and EB from each way play. I'm, actually, I spoke to Peter Scoovemore earlier and he's very keen from an each way perspective on the chances of Big River. Just says he wants the, without it being called off, wants as much rain as possible, basically, because um, he said he will just jump and he'll gallop in or stay. And, uh, hasn't got much weight. I think 10 8 on his back and I think he's around the 20 to 1 mark. You know, we've seen what an out and out stare he is. I mean, the Ultima was run on heavy at Cheltenham over three miles. He was outpaced and came up the hill into fourth or fifth or whatever so he's he's a he's an out and out stare so yeah i'm i'm two each way plays against the protagonists and um i'll be bobo mac each way i think he's around 14s and uh big river around the 20 to mop 20 to one mop yeah big river 20 to one pretty much across the board bobo mac 16 to one with hills and 888 sport as short as 11 to one elsewhere there for bobo mac uh finally we're just going to touch on the savills chase back over to ireland of course and just an Irish field here because of the travel restrictions. Uh, Manella Indo is the two to one favourite ahead of presenting Percy at nine to two, Delta Work five to one, Kenboy seven to one, Aplutard eight to one, Sam Crow twelve to one, Alaho twelve to one, Monoli fourteen to one, uh, who of course would have been running at Kempton on Boxing Day sixteen to one bar. And Ed, you know, we did a, a Cheltenham anti post preview last week and you know the, the names that I've just read out there were, were, were pretty significant in our in our discussions. This is an absolute cracker. Absolutely, and this is a bit of a kind of a, this will sort out a lot of the pecking order, at least in Ireland, won't it? With the the spring targets ahead, uh, absolutely what a wonderful race. It really, really, really is top class horses. Again, not much between them on official figures. Uh, obviously, you've got Manella Indos just looked uh, impeccable so far this season. And obviously, ran really well in the RSA. Presenting Percy looks rejuvenated, doesn't he? Mm. Uh, now he's with Gordon Elliott, uh, Kenboy in there as well. I mean, some really, really good horses. On balance, the one I've always said, and I thought was a bit overpriced in this, I was it's a bit priced up generally speaking, around third or fourth favourite all the way along, is Delta Work, who won this race last year. And I think he's perhaps unfairly gets knocked because... Given his two biggest hours at Cheltenham, if you like, he hasn't quite produced the goods. Finished third in the RSA and got going far too late after shoddy round and jumping in the Gold Cup last year, staying on up the hill into to fifth or sixth. Uh, but he's in his own backyard here. He's three from three over fences in Leopardstown. He's never lost a race at this track, including winning this race last year. And I just think this is his contest. For whatever reason, he comes alive here. He, he's a high class horse. And not all horses do perform to the best at Cheltenham. Having said that, I still think he's is the value for the Cheltenham Gold Cup, given he's two and a half, three times the price of some of the other horses, which on official figures he's right up there with. So uh, I think Delta work at the prices. This is his, this is his race. And I think he'll take a lot of beating here. Delta work five to one, that standout best price with William Hill. Andrew? Uh, I can see exactly where Ed's coming from here with uh, Delta work. Yeah, he, he sticks out like a sore thing. Where I was presenting Percy, just he, he, his form round Leopardstown has been, he's been in the mix. But not winning round there. But I've been so... Imp- I know he's his favourite, Minello Indo, and maybe a little bit shorter than he should be, but from a performance point of view, I just think, whatever reason, I think he's clicked this year. And you forget, he's only seven. Mm-hmm. You know, he's only a seven-year-old. You know, he won the Albert Bartlett in gruelling con- in, in, in grueling fashion. But this year, I just think that the, the jumping's clicked. How, how he jumped first time out and the performance he put in when Henry Henry de Bromhead was genuinely pleasantly surprised on how he performed first time out and how forward he was. Then last time out, he found a turn of gear I didn't realise he had. He's my back him now for the Gold Cup. I do. I just think you know he loves Cheltenham. I think I think we'll see. I think we could see a sparkling performance at Leopardstown. You know, it's it's a it's a funny old race because there's not that much jumping, is there? It's a bit like um, it's a bit like Cheltenham over hurdles. There's only about two fences in the last uh, mile and a half. No, but the last six furlongs, should we say? So there's not that much jumping. And you know how Irish races are run. There'll be a lot there coming round the bend, coming down to the last. But I can just see Manella Indoor finding that change of gear. He's seven years old, still unexposed. I just like him a lot. Yeah, Manella Indo is eight to one for the Cheltenham Gold Cup, and and your friend, my friend Andy Holding, 
very keen on Manella Indo as well there. And Manella Indo is two to one for the Savills chase and could see a sparkling performance, according to Andrew Thornton there. We're nearly done. I'm nearly going to wish you happy Christmas and send you on your way. But before we do so, let's give the listeners a Christmas present, a Christmas nap. Ed, coming to you first, this can be in a race we've already discussed or you can pluck one from elsewhere during this bumper festive calendar. Yeah, be uh, shishkin at one to four on the... Uh, on the... <laughs> <laughs> no, um... On um, on December the 27th at Kempton, obviously, yeah, Altior and Shishkin will grab all the headlines. But in the three-mile handicap chase there, horse of Paul Nichols called Adjuran Dupont, who um, his recent form doesn't inspire. However, he won this race back in 2018 off a mark of 144, and the old uh, Paul Nichols team got him in here off 142. Uh, he's been there and done it. Ground to be absolutely perfect for him. This has got to be the target. This is his race, if you like. And I think he'll be absolutely geared and trained to the minute for this contest. Uh, uh, last I saw, he was trading around the 10, 11 to 1 mark uh, in that uh, in that Labrox handicap chase. And over three miles back at Kempton, that's his happy hunting ground. Adrian Dupont, uh, each way player, I, I think he's rock solid in that. Adrian Dupont there, Fred. I should say the reason why we haven't covered the uh, Saturday racing in detail, uh, sorry, sorry, the Sunday racing in detail, the 27th, is just because we're recording this on the Wednesday. And by the time you listen to it, lots of horses would have cut up and races would have cut up and prices wouldn't be there anymore. But one to look out for there from Ed. And of course, do download the app and you can get Andy's thoughts on the day, which will be sent straight to you. Uh, Andrew, what's your Christmas cracker? I'm going to go for a bit of a value at Wing Canton um, in the Potemps. He's got top weight, but he's got a five-pound claim by Jordan, uh, Jordan Naylor on board. Mario de Pale. I thought the, he ran in the uh, the Welsh champion hurdle um, behind So Royal. Uh, Buzz was back in third. Um, lightly squeezed was further, but was behind him. He came out and ran a blinder at, at Ascot over the weekend. And just, uh, he went up to Weatherby and, uh, and won, I thought, in cosy fashion up there. He's gone up five pounds for that. Jordan Naylor takes that five pounds off. So he's got 11.7 to carry. Mario De Pale, Sam Thomas, having a good time with things. He won't mind how much rain they get either. Mario De Pale in the 2.45 at Wincanton on Boxing Day. There you have it. Hopefully plenty there. There's so much racing. I apologise for any races that we didn't cover that you want to add us to. We'll be back though very soon with more racing previews. So thank you very much to our guests, Andrew and Ed, uh, do have a fantastic Christmas. Do enjoy the racing after Christmas Day as well, as much as we can. Hopefully this time next year, we'll be back to having a bumper schedule and we'll all be at races uh, at the meetings as well. But do enjoy the racing and please do gamble responsibly.